thank you all for joining us this morning. Um, like I said, we do have a guest speaker, Mario, this morning. So thank you again very much uh, for joining us. And as usual, um, this is really a space for you all um, to discuss anything um, Marriott will be um, talking about, as well as you have the space to ask um, any questions about TMP online. So feel free to either unmute yourself or um, if you can't speak for whatever reason, you can always uh, chat in, in, there is like a chat um, icon as well. But a few words about Marriott, which you can also see on your screen. So Marriott is an art historian by trade and she's holding a PhD in theology. And before ending up at the University of Amsterdam Library, she traveled around a few research institutions for a couple of years. And at the library, she's responsible for everything they do to support research data management. Marriott has been doing that for about seven years. And what's lovely to see is that she is still very much enjoying that. Um, so with saying that, Marriott, I'll just mute myself and the floor is yours. Thank you. And I am going to share my screen. I have to find out whether I can. I'll, I'll just share my entire screen. Uh, that's not becoming active. I just made you a presenter, so hopefully this will work now. Uh, hopefully that will work. Uh, uh, no, that doesn't work well. Anyway, I, I, I just do my presentation. I had prepared a few slides, but I can do my presentation without slides as well because uh, I pretty much know it by heart. Um, what I want to talk about, I'm, I'm, I am I'm was thinking about, well, what kind of, 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 of subject to, uh, uh, to discuss. And uh, I mean, there are a number of subjects we can choose from the research data management area. Um, there's a lot to think about uh, and there's a lot we can discuss. Uh, but I want to look at the uh, questions you get when you provide uh, resource data management support. What uh, kind of questions do you get? And um, there's a number of questions. I, I put them in several categories, and, immedi and uh, immediately my computer starts cooperating, I think. Uh, you should be seeing my screen now. Um, Yes, we do. Thank you. Okay, very good, very good. Um, uh, a few words first about how we uh, at the University of Amsterdam and the Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences, because I serve two institutions, have organized our research data management support. Um, it, it's a, a four-legged beast, if you want to call it that. Uh, that. Um, we have a website that serves uh, general information on research data management. Uh, it's available 24-7 in Dutch and English. We were, by the time we made that website, already planning on uh, uh, outfitting a service desk, but we knew beforehand that people couldn't be there for 24 hours a day. So we needed a backup uh, in instances. I mean, if you know researchers, you know also that they work at night, they work sometimes during the night, uh, and in the strangest moments, they come up with questions. So they needed to have something 24-7 to turn to with their questions. So we set up a website, which is general information, not really uh, subject specific, um, but at least the, the basics about resource data management, uh, resources can find there. To introduce them to the concept of research data management, I mean, a few, a few years ago, we really had to introduce them. They never heard of research data management, and uh, they didn't know whether it was something they should think about. Uh, we started uh, elective workshops on research data management. Uh, workshops are two hours long. We start with an introduction on what is research data management and why are we talking about that now and why is it becoming important, and then move on to the data management plan, which is the second hour of the workshop and the most important thing for researchers, because that mostly is the thing that they uh, uh, start thinking about research data management uh, through. Uh, they don't do that naturally, uh, mostly, um, but when they have to submit a research data management plan to a funder, for example, that's another hoop they need to jump through. So then that's when the questions start, and we wanted to prepare them for that. 
We've also acquired a data repository. We have a publications repository, uh, but that wasn't suited for data uh, files. So we decided uh, to acquire uh, another repository, especially for data uh, files. And we started the service desk. And the repository was Fixture. We acquired Fixture in 2017. And in 2018, we added DMP online uh, to help with making data management plans. And this is the big button on our home screen on the RDM website. If you have any questions on recent data management, contact RDM support. We are moving in from research data management support into research data support. So we are losing the M. That's not to say that we don't say anything uh, or can't advise on research data management. But we have, over the past five years, uh, concluded that uh, researchers need more support than just research data management. So we are widening our scope. And uh, in a few years, we're going to evaluate that, whether that's a success or not. But right now, I do want to talk about the questions that we get from uh, researchers that come in to RDM support. And let's start with the first one. Uh, this is one I, I actually, um, I mean, I copy paste this from an email uh, from a researcher, uh, researcher in the science faculty. Uh, she was trying to understand how much she needed to do for the data management section of her grant proposal. And she asked, can you help me understand what is wanted or required? And this is a question that I, uh, uh, I mean, I start uh, flying the flag and, and I put up a festive uh, arrangement in my room. I'm very happy if a researcher asks this. Because usually uh, researchers have a, a sort of quick fire question session. They have a question, they want an answer uh, so they can move on. And that all has to be done within five minutes preferably at the moment that they ask the question. Um, so there is hardly any time for, well, let's call it reflection. Let's call it thinking about what we are doing and why we are doing it. So if a researcher uh, really asks a question as open as this one, uh, really explain to me what what research data management, what it's about, and why why should I think about that, and what should I think about exactly? Um, that's a, a reason for the party. I don't uh, party too openly because uh, I don't want to offend the other researchers. But there's a secret party going on once a question like this comes in. Alternatively, we also have researchers that ask this: Do we have a sample text on data management that I can use in my grant proposal? So I can copy paste something, and I have gotten through that hoop. This is a question. Well, um, I don't know what's what's the opposite of party. Uh, um, opposite of party happening in my office when this question comes in because we do not want researchers to demonstrate to a funder that they are very apt at a copy pasting. I mean, we uh, sort of uh, think that they are, but we do not need to know that, and they do not need to prove it. But we sometimes do have researchers who just ask a sample text or a sample data management plan or any anything that they don't have to think about themselves. Um, Another one is the tricky category. Um, I mean, this was a question from a researcher in musicology uh, who was interviewing people both in Europe and America. And she was wondering, well, OK, uh, uh, when when I'm, I'm not aiming at getting in a conflict with an interviewee, but if I do, then what happens? Is it that conflict resolved according to Dutch law, because I am from the Netherlands, or is it according to the law of his or her country? Well, plain and simple answer to this question, to the law of his or her country. But um, this question stands for a wider category of questions, mostly legal, uh, that are somewhat more tricky to answer because at the library, I mean, um, hey, I'm a theologian. I'm not a, a legal expert, although I have been pretty much getting uh, around in, in, in legal documents and, and, and stuff like that, but I'm still not a legal person. I'm not uh, someone who can have actually 
support a researcher on that. On the other hand, we have a department legal affairs, but they concentrate mostly on, on things like property holdings by the university and, 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 and all that kind of thing. They, they really do not see researchers as a kind of people that they need to provide support to. And I've been working for a couple of years now to change that, but that's slow going. Let's uh, put it uh, that way. Um, so the legal questions often come to us, although they may not belong with us. Uh, but we are doing the best we can. And we often answer these kind of questions with a disclaimer. We start our answer with a disclaimer. Well, we are not legal people. But if we just use common sense, then we think it's like this. And we have a body of documents to uh, support our, uh, our views. But this is and remains a tricky category. Another one is this one. What's the best way to store digital images and make them accessible? What are the best archiving programs? Well, really nice, but this is a question on which I can't give an answer because the best way differs per researcher, per subject area, per research project. Um, I, don't, I don't have a standard answer on, uh, well, if you have digital images, use this. And if you have uh, an archiving uh, issue, use that. Um, this is a question that leads to follow-up questions to the researcher. Well, what kind of researcher are you? What kind of research are you doing? We can often see because <clears throat> If we see their email address, we see their name, so we can look them up. We can find out to which faculty they belong. But then we often do not yet know what kind of research they are doing. And for example, uh, uh, digital images, uh, well, what do you want to use them for? I mean, uh, do you want to just store them somewhere? Or do you need to show them to someone and someone has to give input looking at the pictures? Or do they need to, uh, if you want to do that, do they need to be seen in a particular order? Um, things like that are the follow-up questions we ask to be able to help a researcher to find whatever works for that particular researcher. And if the next day another researcher comes in with the same question, we start the asking questions process uh, all over again because that's a different research, it may be in a different subject area, maybe needing something else. Another category, this is the last one from my presentation. Uh, this was a professor who emailed me, well, my article has been uh, accepted by PLOS One. And anyone working in research data management for a few years, uh, I have been now, knows that PLOS One was one of the first publishers to have pretty strict guidelines about availability of data. So if you want to publish with us, that's OK. But if we accept your article, you also need to share your data. You need to give a link to where your data are, and people need to be able to access that data. Um, this was a researcher who knew that because, well, he had already submitted and had accepted an article uh, in, in PLOS One. But now he was looking for any ethical or legal restrictions that are acceptable to PLOS as a reason not to publish our data. Because what he was afraid of, it was a two-tronged uh, reason. Uh, on the one hand, he was afraid of being scooped, so someone else discovering something in his data that uh, was something important, uh, something to publish about, something to make a name for his or herself. Um, on the other hand, he was going on about the data being very complicated, having been collected over 10, 20 years. And uh, well, it was a big data set, so nobody would know his way around that data. So why bother making the data accessible? That was somewhat contradictory. I mean, on the one hand, uh, you say, well, someone who gets into this data won't understand a bit of it. On the other hand, well, uh, maybe there is someone who gets into this data and then discovers something that I haven't seen myself yet. So I, I'm being scooped, and I don't want that. Um, actual research, uh, because I, I asked uh, some more questions. Well, uh, what kind of research have you done? It was about fruit flies. 
So this is the category of uh, saying something to a researcher that a researcher does not want to hear. Because, at least in the Netherlands, but I think worldwide, fruit flies don't enjoy any kind of privacy. Uh, so there are no really legal or ethical restrictions that you can put in place to say, well, I don't share my data. So I had to talk uh, to, to tell this uh, this professor that well, um, either you have two choices: either you make your data public and you take a gamble that your data is indeed as complicated as you say it is, and a researcher won't discover anything in it, or you withdraw your article from Plus One. Uh, up until now, I haven't checked what he has actually done, so I, I should be uh, doing that for the next presentation so I can tell what happened. Um, but this is something that you also have to be aware of, that you can tell researchers that can come with their questions and you tell them uh, what they uh, can do and, and what uh, tools they can use, but you sometimes also have to tell them things they do not want to hear. I've never heard from this professor again, so maybe he's still cross with me, but um, there's uh, only so much I can do. And um, we just try to be there for a researcher. I mean, um, one category that isn't in this presentation is the category of the researcher that is slightly panicking because uh, he or she has applied for European funding and um, Horizon 2020 or another uh, European possibility for funding. And then they get uh, the results of their ethics review back. And that is five, six, seven pages of uh, remarks they have to answer to. Um, and sometimes uh, um, a researcher can start to really panic, well, this is a hoop I'm never going to get through. And that's the moment that you go to a researcher and say, well, okay, I can sit with you for an hour, two hours maybe, and we'll go through it together. And then a researcher is very happy that at least someone is uh, sharing the pain and uh, you also know that that's something I would like to add as the final thing. Um, a researcher is also very dependent on, on funders, so they really want to do what's right according to the funder. But sometimes the funder is asking absolute nonsense. I mean, I could put that uh, very uh, much more diplomatically, but um, it comes down to asking nonsense. I've had one researcher who um, got a reply, an ethics review from uh, from Europe, a European funder, that says, well, okay, you're going to do field work in America and in Amsterdam and in Berlin. Um, you have to, in America, uh, uh, acquire permission from a data authority that you are allowed to accept to export your field work data to Amsterdam. And then I asked the researcher, upon reading that, I asked the researcher, well, how much do you want to keep your funder happy? Or are you willing to take a gamble? Well, he was willing to take a gamble, albeit he was panicking, but he was willing to take a gamble. So I said, well, that, let's just ask them what authority that should be. Because knowing American uh, privacy laws, uh, there is not just one single privacy law in America. Privacy has been scattered over all kinds of laws and there is no central data authority. So what authority should give him the permission as requested by his European funder? So he put uh, the question back to the funder. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to get this permission, but please tell me where do I need to get it? And at first he got a reply, well, um, okay, we have to think about that. We have to uh, meet and reconvene. And as soon as we know, we'll let you know. And three months later, he got the message, well, uh, don't bother. You can ignore that part of the ethical review because uh, it's not important. At least it's not important. They simply did not know. So it's uh, us at Re uh, RDM support, we also have a freer position uh, uh, towards funders and towards others who sometimes ask uh, terribly difficult things that aren't true or aren't as well informed as we try to be. And that's it. Brilliant, Marriott. Thank you very much. I think this was very interesting. And as you were uh, speaking, we received a few questions. So um, 
I would like to uh, just read a few questions that came through. So there was a first question for you um, asking, do you have any legal support at RDM support services? Uh, no, we do not. Um, uh, uh, we had, uh, I mean, we do have an apartment for legal, uh, legal affairs. Uh, but as I said, uh, they worry about just about everything except research. And I am trying to get through to them that they should be paying attention uh, to research and that uh, research is certainly an area that uh, should be provided with legal uh, support. But at the University of Amsterdam, that has not yet been arranged. So I'm, I'm, I'm busy trying to get that through to the legal people that they really need to support uh, research. They, uh, it, has become over the past year somewhat clearer to them uh, because funders from uh, especially European funders but also Dutch funders ask for a declaration from the uh, data protection officer that uh, things regarding data protection are in order so then uh, the uh, data protection officer is somewhat uh, uh, alarmed well okay uh, but but has any anyone from legal looked at this research so that's a way of getting it through but it's it's not really plain sailing mm -hmm. um and another question we received for you um uh, mm -hmm. is how do you react to non-party requests um do you offer sample dmps or point to websites do you offer support and try to motivate researchers. I'm not sure what non-party requests um, is, though. Um, I don't know, I can't remember who raised this question. Uh, Kirsten Helbeck was asking about this. How do you react to non-party requests? Do you well, if, if, if I understand non-party requests to be people from outside of the University of Amsterdam, we do get that kind of request sometimes, not very often. Um, and it depends on, on the request, whether we can uh, uh, actually uh, uh, request for sample text. OK. Um, to, to finish my sentence, uh, uh, it depends on the question that is asked, whether we uh, um, reply to it or um, actually reply, give a, uh, an answer or reply to it that we uh, uh, suggest the researcher start, uh, contacts his own uh, support uh, system at its own university. Usually uh, we uh, refer people to their own university and then sometimes we know better what people they need to speak to than they do themselves. So that sometimes is also uh, somewhat of a signal that they haven't uh, at that university haven't made enough uh, uh, name for themselves yet but well at least we can point uh, researchers from other universities to the right people as well. Um, when it comes to legal, uh, uh, to, to sample text, we do have sample text, but I provide them as, uh, um, well, um, 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 I try not to provide them because I, we are still in the beginning days of research data management and we do want researchers to think about research data management themselves. And uh, the issue with sample texts is that they don't think. I mean, they just copy paste a sample text and they think that they have done everything they need to do, but um, they need to do a bit of thinking as well. Uh, on the other hand, if, if a researcher contacts me with whom I've had, uh, with whom I've been in contact before, and that's a researcher who is pressed for time and uh, uh, has previously given me an, uh, uh, the opportunity to explain about research data management, then of course I provide that researcher with a sample text that's not a problem but I try to uh, gauge the situation is it a researcher that doesn't yet know anything and hasn't yet thought about anything or is it a researcher that had done it 20 times already and is now pressed for time and needs something quickly and just hasn't got the time to think and that that makes my my answer different Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, we were having another question for you. Um, a change of name from RDM to research data, uh, broader scope, 
Does that mean that you are considering offering data science guidance or training? Um, and you're saying, I'm interested as this is something we are being asked to support. Yeah, well, it, I'm, I'm, this is really, uh, that change of name is it really, uh, um, I'm having a call about it tomorrow afternoon uh, with the director of the library. Uh, uh, so it is really, really, really early, early stages. But uh, I, I began about wanting to change the name two years ago. So on the other hand, it's not really early ch stages. Uh, we are being asked to support more than just data management. Um, we got questions, for example, from researchers who want to use library resources, uh, who, for example, have access to JSTOR and want to harvest JSTOR, uh, certain articles from JSTOR over a period of 40 years. They want to harvest those articles and then do some analysis, some text analysis or whatever, uh, uh, text data mining on those articles. And then they uh, get to uh, the problem of how to harvest those articles and how to do that in a, a manageable way because they, of course, they can go sit at their computer and copy paste every article, but that's not the quickest way of doing things. But they tend to not know what the quickest way of doing things is. And I don't know either, but I have a colleague who is more technical than I am, uh, who is very much able to help with that. So we get more and more questions that venture into research data or data science, uh, um, digital humanities is also uh, uh, an umbrella term, but uh, also where we get questions from. So it really is in response to a question from, from researchers and getting those questions getting broader than just research data management. Okay, thank you very much, Mariette. Um I think we'll just start moving on a little bit. Just a last comment. Um, Thanks for the talk, Marriott. I found it a great example of how much you need to collaborate with various units of the organization to support research data concerns uh, coming from Sarah Jones. Um, but yeah, your talk has been fantastic. And I think there is actually quite a lot of interest in it. So um, if any of these attendees feel free to um, drop us an email to help this guy. I don't know, Marriott, whether you're happy um, to maybe get into if, if you have any questions whatsoever or would like to talk about this a bit more, uh, I'm, I'm available, so drop me a line and uh, that's okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much to Marriott. Um, this has been fantastic. Um, just to move on with the session a little bit because um, we have been taking some time here, but it's been very interesting to hear about everything. Uh, we just thought uh, that we'll give you a few updates about the DMP online. So um, I don't know, Patricia, whether you would like to take over here and just to say a few words maybe about the Rails 5 upgrade. Uh, yes, I can. Um, thanks, Magdalena. Um, so our Rails 5 upgrade work is still ongoing. Um, I think you've heard that for quite a quite a while now, but there's uh, there's an end in sight. Uh, and um, while that's like, yeah, reasonably boring backend infrastructure work, um, I think the, the good news uh, is that it will then allow us to work on some uh, new features such as um, the, the upload of documents uh, and so, some other things that uh, um, you, you have been asking for. Um, so yeah, we'll we'll try to wrap that up um, over the summer and then um, uh, we can get back to actually uh, addressing feature requests that came in from the community. Um, I don't know, Diana, if you want to quickly say anything about the user testing. Um, our survey is still open. I'll drop the link in the chat. So if anyone hasn't filled that yet, uh, please do. Thank you. Ah, Diana, um, you're still muted. Apologies. Okay, thanks, Patricia. Um, yes, I just um, wanted to say, uh, I, I don't know how many of you are, are new to this, that we are doing uh, carrying out usability tests for DMP online. Um, we are, um, as Patricia said, uh, our survey, uh, online survey is still open and I'd really appreciate it if you fill it in. 
Uh, we definitely want to, to hear from as many of you as possible. We're also carrying out uh, task completion tests that last about half an hour, 45 minutes, and we're looking for users who have um, no experience of DMP online, um, ideally postdoctoral researchers. Um, we're quite good um, for users from the UK, but we would need international users. So those of you from abroad, if you know somebody who hasn't used the tool, just uh, forward them on to us, um, who hasn't used the tool and is willing to, uh, to spend half an hour to 45 minutes on um, taking the test, completing some tasks from um, creating an account to, I don't know, adding a question to a template. They're very simple tasks, or ought to be very simple tasks. Um, and the, um, the, the other thing we are doing is um, we are asking, um, sorry where was i so we're doing the the usability tasks we're doing um a survey and there was one other thing we we're doing that is not coming to mind apologies about this um so the reason why we're doing this is because in 2015 we did carry a complete um, um usability test just to assess the interface of the tool um and since then, the tool has grown and has changed a lot, particularly on the administrative side where we've added new features and new features. And we want to find out whether these features really work well for you. Um, so we'd really appreciate your input. Um, and uh, working with me is Theo. Theo is in. Maybe you can show your face. Theo? Um, I'm sure he's. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Hi, there he is. Theo, introduce yourself, say a few words. Yep. Hello, I'm Theo. I'm a fourth year student at University of Edinburgh, and I'm doing an internship for usability testing. So I'll be running uh, usability tests and interviews. Okay. Brilliant. So, um, yeah, if you had the time to get in touch with Diana and follow the link for taking the survey as well, it's much appreciated because we want to make sure the tool is working well for you. Uh, um, and just, I wanted to let you know, um, I started to think um, just by watching some usability testing last week um, with one of our admin users that it might be worth starting um, very short demo sessions where I would be running with you through some basic functionalities. Um, I do appreciate everyone is at a different level. Um, so, you know, some of the functionalities would be com coming, you know, covering more basic things, whereas other demo sessions would be covering more advanced functionalities. These are partially being covered um, already in my video tutorials, but I thought it would be quite nice to make it as this kind of drop-in session where um, you, you would be able to come along and ask me questions at each stage because when I'm making these tutorial videos, you just follow what I do. Whereas I thought if we do it in a form of demo, very uh, short training around certain functionalities, um, I might be able to explain certain things if you ask me questions as we go along and this might help the other users as well. Um, I'm thinking, I'm not entirely sure how much time uh, the preparation and other things would take, but I'm thinking it would be either uh, once a month or uh, if the preparation for this is not too time intense, I might be running these even every two weeks. Um, but yeah, if you have any thoughts, feel free to drop us an email to dmponline at dcc.ac.uk um, and let us know what you think, whether you would appreciate this to be more on the basic um, things or more the advanced, or whether you would like these to be also from the user perspective. Um, so not just covering the admin interface, but maybe um, covering, I don't know, how the user is using the tool. I think we are receiving actually some, we received some question in here um, from Joachim about customizing template. Is it possible to customize, change the answer format uh, of existing customizable templates? Okay, I think it's just because we are running a little bit out of time. What we will do, if I can ask Patricia to take and notes of the things that are coming through. Yeah, I'm happy um, to jump in and answer that one if you like. <laughs> kind of yes, sorry, go on. 
Oh, DM, DM my meeting. Um, so, Joachim, the customizing um, templates, you can, as an admin user, you can only edit the sections that you control. So, any sections you've added, you can change the question formats. But we don't allow you to change the funders' questions just because some funders are really specific on what they want or what format it's in. So, it depends which aspect of the template you're talking about. I'd be tempted down the line to consider a feature where um, if the funder has a full text answer, so it's not really kind of codified or constrained in any way, that you could let an admin uh, kind of constrain that to one of our formatted answers. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I got that, but uh, the thing is it would be much more convenient to just to use the customizable template uh, to copy the questions and then work from there to create your own then uh, yes we have received that by the way from various mm. in in our interviews and on one of the tests but mostly in the interviews with very experienced administrators who have said it would be very easy to be able to take one section and mm -hmm. trans be able to reuse it across several templates so yeah. it's coming we, we we are receiving that input so <laughs> if you want uh, to give us more feedback please let us know but okay. um if you if you'd like an interview um, with me and Theo, and you can just do your outpouring yeah. <laughs> of grief. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So um, but, yes, but that has come out repeatedly. Yeah. Yeah, okay. that has come across Great. repeatedly. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, just a few more things. If you, I, I just don't want to be taking too much uh, space by me repeating the links and stuff. So I, we share the links for the June newsletter with you in the chat and uh, the recordings from our um, last month session and also the link to whole recordings. But if there are any more questions, um, feel free to either unmute yourself or just drop us a question in the chat. And if there is nothing you can think of at this very moment, um, don't forget you can always uh, drop us an email to dmponline at dcc.ac.uk. Um, and if I could just maybe ask either Patricia or Diana to share uh, the social media links uh, with you in a case you know you are not following us just there. It's a quite nice resource um, to see what we are currently working on as well as place where we tend to advertise um, the next drop-in sessions. Um, but for everyone who is here now, we can just let you know our next drop-in session is going to be um, on the 6th of August. Help us then the UK time and our guest speaker next month will be Peter Smith from the Sheffield Hallam University. So if you have the time, definitely do join us. Um, but if there are no more questions, um, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Sarah, for being um, our secret um, um, it's lovely to see you all um, and see such a big group. It's nice to see the community flourishing. And thank you for jumping in and explaining a few more things still, even <laughs> though you're up with us. It's very kind. Um, thank you, Marriott, very much. Um, your talk, I think, um, has been very interesting for everyone who joined us today. And um, I'll, I'll try to um, share everything we have written in our newsletter um, in July. And thank you, Sam and Patricia and Diana um, for and jumping in and helping me out. And thank you all for joining today. It's been fantastic to see such a big attendance. And we all hope to see you next month. Bye, everyone. See you. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.